morning and welcome to the Mars Base Camp Plenary. We're here live in Adelaide, Australia, and we're also streaming on Australia Science Channel. I'm uh, super excited to be here and, uh, and can't wait to see the presentation. Um, by way of introductions, the, uh, the presenters today are the architects and engineers uh, who came up with the Mars Base Camp vision. Uh, to avoid the long introductions and get on with the show, suffice it to say uh, they have as many degrees as my thermometer. Um, but while I'm up here live streaming and, and live on stage, I'll take a, just a minute to tell you a few things about each of them that they might not share uh, on their own. You uh, know we can uh, hear you from the backstage, right? Oh, okay. Well, uh... We are explorers. The time is now. point in history if we have the technology, the know-how, and the public excitement to send humans past the moon and on to Mars. We're building Orion now, a spacecraft like no other designed for deep space human exploration. But to get to Mars, we can't just take Orion. It needs to be part of a, a larger system that has the supplies and the scientific equipment required for a thousand day journey that will take us hundreds of millions of miles away. We call our concept Mars Base Camp. presented an architecture on how to start exploring the Martian system by 2028. Mars Base Camp is a vision, one that requires international partnerships, collaboration with public and private institution, as well as the technological know-how of everyone to achieve the greatest feat in human exploration history. The U.S. Congress passed the NASA Transition Authorization Act of 2017 unanimously. Amongst all the other great things NASA does, it set forth plans to take humans to Mars in the 2030s and to set predecessor capabilities in cislunar space in the 2020s. So NASA's looking for ideas. Now one of the things that our bosses love is when we go off script to tell a little story, so we'll do that real quick before they cut our mics. So my wife, lovely wife Michelle, and I have three kids. Little kid is, is Evie, she's 11. And uh, for the friends across the pond, she actually plays viola and rugby, uh, which makes her a reasonably well-adjusted yank, uh, such as that goes. And we were driving in the car listening to the radio. And she said, Daddy, that's a great song. It was a few years ago. And she said, Dad, that's a great song. Can you play it again? And I said, well, no, it's the radio. And she's thinking that perhaps I was ignorant on how to operate the radio. She helpfully said, push the little left arrow. And I said, that's not the rewind. That's, that's a tuner. And she looked at me incredulously. And I said, look, it's like there's a guy out there with an iPod, and we're listening to it. And she's like, well, can we call him and ask him to play it? I said, no, it's like everybody is listening everywhere to that same one iPod. And she looked at me like, what are you? And I said, look, turn off the radio. Let's just talk about how your day at school was today. 
So I tell that, that story for two reasons. First, for the, the space generation folks that are here and, and for the millennials that might be watching on, on webcast. Someday you two will start getting old like Gen Xers and have to explain to the next generation the archaic aspects of your technology as you were growing up. But the other one, the other point, is that Mars Base Camp needs to be your playlist. You know, NASA's looking for ideas on how we're going to go out to the moon, how we go out to that deep space gateway, and then on to Mars. We've been exploring deep space for decades, and it's a team sport. It, it's, it's probably the greatest team sport that's ever existed, with the exception of Australian rules football, as I've been finding out this week, but it's the second greatest team sport ever. It's bigger than a single country. It's something that we, all of humanity, need to do together. So as we talk through this today, this isn't Lockheed Martin's vision, and it's not the only vision of how to get to Mars. But we put it out here so that we can globally begin the dialogue and how to make it our playlist. And to make it our playlist, at Lockheed Martin, we think, we think you should actually look at your horizon goal of going to Mars and then build your architecture for study and observation in cislunar space by really focusing on your horizon goal. So let's talk about how and why we can start exploring the Martian orbit, Martian system in about a decade. So why? Why do we explore? Why do we hurl humans out into the solar system? At Lockheed Martin, it's always been about the science. There's fundamental questions that we've been asking for hundreds if not thousands of years. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And are we alone in the cosmos? By sending human astronaut scientists to the Mars system, we're going to be gathering data and performing science that will help to answer these fundamental existential questions. So using Mars Base Camp, we can take scientists on Earth and put them in Martian orbit. They can telerobotically operate rovers and UAVs, as well as explore the moons of Phobos and Deimos, as well as the Martian service. In our reference architecture, we allocated 6,800 kilograms, or for those of you that like US units, 15,000 pounds, as well as 40,000 kilowatts of lab equipment and power to help the scientists astronauts make revolutionary discoveries with all of Earth's scientific community backing them up from home. So Lockheed Martin has been a partner with NASA on every Mars mission um, in one role or another since Viking in 1976. And those orbiters and rovers have discovered amazing things about Mars, including that yeah, ancient Mars may have been able to support life. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has shown that Mars is a complex, dynamic, evolving place. The Phoenix lander used its scoop and brushed off the dust and found that it was sitting on a large surface of water ice. The MAVEN spacecraft, and this is an illustration on the bottom left there, um, has shown that the solar wind uh, is one of the reasons for Mars having lost its atmosphere. And the next spacecraft going to Mars, InSight, next year, is going to study um, Mars's uh, geologic evolution. So water is everywhere on Mars, frozen beneath the surface and even liquid water flowing in special circumstances, as in the recurring slope line. So Mars is dynamic. You know, when you, when you look at a, a dynamic anything that you're studying, you need to be able to, to react to it. You need to be able to make real-time decisions as how to proceed based on what you've just learned or based on, on what is occurring in the thing that you're studying. And so putting astronauts into orbit around Mars allows us to react to these dynamic changing conditions that we never realized were there until the last decade or 15 years, running water on the surface of Mars. Not only is Mars dynamic, it's big. 
Though it's smaller than our native planet, the surface area of Mars is equivalent to the entire landmass of Earth. So imagine trying to explore all of Earth's land with the several rovers. You can see here, this is a great example. Curiosity has been exploring Mars for five years. It's traveled 17 kilometers, or 10 miles in US units. And you can see when you zoom out and look at the entire Martian surface, we have so much more to explore. So, you know, being able to drop those rovers, it, it's still a very large planet no matter what. But being able to react to what you see and drop rovers to these individual locations and with real-time control, you know, the, the light delay is, what, 5 to 25 minutes from Earth to Mars. For Mars orbit, it's a quarter of a second. You can now safely and effectively drive those rovers from one area of interest to another faster than we've done in the past over the last 40 years. And we don't need to invent new technologies or come up with some magical breakthrough. We have the capability to go to Mars now. And that's, that's an important point. In, in, we're going to walk through the peace parts of the Mars Space Camp before we get into the new developments over the last year. But, but like Tony and I talked about last year, all of these elements are not new technology. All of these elements either exist in one form or another today or are actually in active development. So the physical center of Mars Base Camp is the center node with two cupolas. And need not be said that the cupolas came from ESA, right? They've been up on space station for almost a year. Many nations, including the Russians, have built a number of nodes which would serve the purpose, obviously, right here very well. Science, right? You need laboratory space to hold that 15,000 pounds, because I'm English, 15,000 pounds of lab equipment, 40 kilowatts of, of allocated power that Danielle talked about. Here we're showing labs in, in a living area that are made from a, a repurposed uh, universal stage adapter from SLS. But many, many of our nations of our world have created China, Japan, the Europeans, the Russians, and, and, and the Americans have created labs that have flown and are flying in space right now. We know how to do this. So to give our astronauts something more exciting to do, we've added an excursion module. This is comprised of an airlock, which we've built and have existing here. We've used them on space station. And then something similar to a manned maneuvering unit. But this one, as you'll see in a few minutes, kind of has spider legs that allows our astronauts to explore the moons of Phobos and Deimos without disrupting all of the dirt that's on the surface, hopefully finding something like water ice. One of the key tenets of Mars Base Camp is self-rescue. This means that should something happen, should there be an emergency, our crew of six can find their way safely home. But to make the spacecraft more reliable, we have two of almost all the critical systems, starting off with our highly efficient, refuelable cryogenic propulsion stages, which you can see on the end, as well as the tank farms that hold the liquid oxygen and hydrogen. And that self-rescue concept is really important. Um, from the space station, uh, you can be home in hours. From the moon, you can be home in days. Uh, but there isn't really a port options from Mars. Once you commit to that journey, um, you're on your own with your crew and your vehicle. And so we need to make sure that as we architect Mars systems, we can think of all the contingencies um, and we can provide the crew with all the tools they need um, to solve any problem. Um, shown here is the solar electric propulsion um, cargo tug that's part of the Mars Base Camp concept. We use that tug uh, to take the science lab and the center node um, out ahead of the astronauts. Um, and the vehicle is reconfigured 
um, to have the uh, astronauts go out in, in the transit configuration with uh, all of the redundancy they, they need for the trip. And solar electric propulsion is, is really important and great for moving large pieces of cargo um, around, as well as in between each Mars Base Camp mission, the concept is to use the SEP tugs to uh, reposition the science lab and the, the node there each time. And also to make sure that we um, are repurposing and using everything to the best we can, um, the solar arrays on the SCP tug then get repurposed for the main vehicle. And of course, in that spirit of everything has to pull w duty, double duty, uh, the, the solar electric propulsion, when you're done propelling, you have an enormous uh, infrastructure, enormously powerful infrastructure, literally powerful. Um, and that's what allows us to do this unprecedented science. But the heart and soul of Mars Base Camp is the Orion Command Deck and the associated deep space long duration habitats that we're starting to build right now. And Tim's going to talk about that. Orion as the command deck. And yes, Orion should go to Mars. It's a thousand day vehicle. It was designed from the start for long duration missions. And it needs supplies. It needs the living areas that we've talked about. But as the command and control deck, we can leverage the power distribution, the flight software, the avionics, the, the safety systems that are in place. It can serve as the command and control for the whole system as well as a safe haven if anything goes wrong. It's, it's critical and key to the safe exploration of the Mars system. And we've started, of course, already on Orion, and we've started on the habitats. Tim. So Orion's first mission exploration flight test one was in 2014. Uh, I was in the engineering back room for that mission, and, and I remember um, that moment of liftoff, um, that first uh, step into deep space. It, it's, it's quite a moment. Um, and we learned a, a lot uh, from that flight and tested out all the systems. Uh, now we've got Exploration Mission 1 um, down at Kennedy Space Center being built. Uh, that'll be an uncrewed flight um, around the moon in a high orbit over 25 days, um, further than any human rated spacecraft has ever gone. And then the next mission, EM2, um, will be crewed and will take humans back to the moon for the first time since 1972. But the next step in cislunar space um, is really a gateway to the rest of the solar system. Uh, it's called the, the Deep Space Gateway. Um, here's our concept uh, for it. And it's really a place to uh, live and work in deep space, test out the technology, but maybe even important, test out the operations that we need to do in deep space and perform great lunar science and exploration. So I want to review just a little bit the architecture of Deep Space Gateway. And we've talked about this a lot this week at IAC. And those of you who have been here may not have the privilege of sitting in on some of those fantastic sessions. So the Deep Space Gateway is comprised of several elements. At the very back end, you can see the power and propulsion element. This says solar electric propulsion to move the Deep Space Gateway around cis lunar space. In the center is the habitat where the astronauts work, hopefully eat, sleep, and exercise. At the top is an extravehicular activity module that allows astronauts to test out those procedures that they're gonna need when they're at Mars, when they don't have Earth right next to them, backing them up as we do at the space station, as well as to test out our advanced uh, spacesuits. Um, at the bottom is one of the components that really enables the Deep Space Gateway. That's a commercial logistics pod. International partners or commercial partners are critical to enabling us to explore cis lunar space and having them bring up supplies as well as you know, additional equipment for us to test out is critical. You can see that there's a robotic arm. This looks really similar to what we have on the ISS. So again, we're using what we have today, what we know how to do. And this arm allows us to reconfigure the gateway as we get logistics pods or visiting vehicles. And like we talked about, Orion, Orion's here. Not only does it ferry the crew to the Earth, but initially when we launch the Deep Space Gateway and assemble it in space, we leverage Orion and its systems while we develop the Deep Space Gateway habitat. In both Eclis, the avionics, 
And again, we're looking at how do we support astronauts on their thousand day mission to Mars. I'm guessing that everybody saw the announcement this morning that, uh, that uh, Russia has uh, shown an interest in partnering with NASA on the Gateway, and, and that's great, right? We have two folks on the playlist. It's become an eclectic song mix, um, and that, that's fantastic because this is the Gateway. This is the starting point that'll allow us to, to learn more about the moon and then move onward to Mars. So one uh, part of the Deep Space Gateway is the power and propulsion element. And it also has solar electric propulsion capability. Um, and it is a, a prototype um, Mars SEP tug. Um, and the, the technology there is, uh, is really just a scaling up of what we fly today in geosynchronous orbit on our satellites, uh, 12 and a half kilowatt thrusters. Um, and that's going to be um, that efficiency, that, that high specific impulse is really going to be transformational for moving large pieces of cargo around the solar system. And for the Deep Space Gateway, uh, we're going to also use it to move the whole gateway around different orbits around the moon. It's not a static vehicle. It's a, it's a vehicle that can travel around the lunar system. What we're showing here is the extensibility of technology. Like Tim talked about, we have solar electropropulsion. And this is critical for exploration at the cislunar space as well as in Martian orbit. We're showing that you can take solar electric propulsion and scale up this element that we're using at the Deep Space Gateway and pre-position elements like a laboratory, a center node and cupola, as well as a robotic arm and any other type of technology you'd like to send out there in advance. One of the key enablers also for our exploration is enabling our commercial economy. Solar electric propulsion also allows our commercial partners to send out fuel for our refuelable systems. It's one of the critical technologies that really help us explore the entire solar system. So solar electric propulsion in, in use now for well over a decade and we're scaling it up today with the power and propulsion element uh, that NASA is looking to build and start um, imminently. So what's another technology? What's another enabling technology that connects us with the DSG and, the, and then on to Mars Base Camp? Telerobotics. You know, time has shown us arguably over, over the last 10 years and then more with each passing year, robots and humans together can do so much more than they can independently. It's true synergism, right? And we talked earlier about the dynamic nature and having humans in orbit that can drop you know, hey, I'm going to drop a probe there and I'm going to send another probe there based on what I learned. And we can also transit quickly across that surface area, equal to the entire landmass of the Earth, like Danielle said. But there's another benefit of having the, the, the robotics and the humans in synergy, and that's tough terrain. Some of the most interesting places on both the Moon and Mars are very hard to get to with standard rovers that like nice flat terrain. So imagine you're in ZOG, Mars Base Camp, Deep Space Gateway, um, and you're operating a rover down on the surface, um, operating it through a, a lava tube, making decisions about where to go and what to examine, um, and really being able to accelerate the pace of science, um, and in some cases for the more mundane tasks like driving and just being able to go faster. And we understand that that'll take uh, new classes of, of robots to explore these planets, um, um, but we're, we're ready to take on that challenge. So like Tim talked about, when you're operating UAVs, you can also telerobotically operate rovers from the Deep Space Gateway on the lunar surface. But one of the things I want to highlight is the international and commercial partners that are really driving innovation. Part-time scientists are a great example. They're offering up what they call the Audi Lunar Quattro. It's a robotic rover in which you can get a payload on it yourself and transmit data to a base. Now, one of the things the Deep Space Gateway offers is we could be a communication relay for your high bandwidth data that's being beamed from the lunar surface back to Earth. So the key here is that partnership between humans and robots, handing off one to the other from autonomous to crew to uh, different systems. 
Actually, so uh, Danielle and I had a chance to, to meet the part-time scientist folks in Beijing uh, at GLEX this summer. And uh, Danielle and them were talking nerdy engineering geek speak, and, and they said, oh, by the way, the, the rover talks to the lander that it comes in on via 3G wireless cell technology, effectively. So, of course, I leaned over and I said, oh, that means ET can actually phone home. And like half of them didn't get it. <laughs> it's another proof that the millennials are taking over without proper appreciation for cultural 1980s. I did get it. So, so everything that we do with telerobotic systems is just going to accelerate our ability to cover large distances, the ability to respond to dynamic changing events, and the ability to go places that you can't go with humans or robots by themselves. But sometimes, like grandma used to say, you got to get your hands on, right? Being able to go out to the, the moons of Phobos and Deimos, we, we alluded to earlier, Danielle talked about that excursion module and the spider legs here. And uh, it's kind of like scuba diving, right? You don't want to stir up all the dust on these very low gravity bodies. And, and so you're walking along on these crawler legs, taking samples and testing them at Mars Base Camp, at the lab. But let's talk now about sample return, high value sample returns from both the moon and Mars. So Mars Base Camp is a great um, staging point for receiving samples launched robotically from the surface of Mars. Um, and, and in the beginning, we, we know how important those samples are and there's planetary protection requirements, so we need to design all the facilities to do that. And the, the crew's role there will be to use their unique skills at rendezvous and docking, um, handling equipment in space, and to inspect and make sure the samples are still pristine, pristine and so they can be uh, placed on Orion to be sent home. But as we get more experience with those samples, the laboratory in orbit um, at Mars um, will perhaps with the right precautions be able to look at samples before sending them back. And of course the, the Mars moon samples uh, ha have less concern um, and we'll be able to really curate uh, the, that, uh, those samples. Safe, careful, high integrity sampling and analysis is critical for understanding where we come from, and how we fit into this world, as well as where are we going. It also allows for commercial markets to map those high value resources on the lunar surface and really develop that commercial economy that will make our space exploration go that much further. So all of, all of these things, all of these capabilities, the, the processes, the, uh, uh, the ability to, to gather samples and to launch them, orbital rendezvous to grab them, the curation that, uh, that Tim talked about. Those are all directly the things that we're going to do both at the Moon and Mars for, for reasons at both locations. So water is everywhere in the solar system. And anywhere we want to send humans, oh, water is there. Um, it, it really is the fuel for exploration, um, and, and not just for making hydrogen and oxygen rocket fuel, but also for the astronauts to drink um, and to create oxygen for them to breathe. So in 2016, United Launch Alliance announced a study in which they put the price point of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen around cislunar space at $1,000 per kilogram and on the lunar surface of $500 per kilogram. Well, this is just an initial study and it starts that conversation of how do we actually mine the materials, how do we enable our refuelable systems, and what can we do feeding forward to the Martian orbit? So, so why? why? Why did United Launch Alliance come out with this? water-based economy. So one of the, the key tenets of, of Mars Base Camp that we talked about is those cryopropulsion stages and they're LOX hydrogen, not methane, LOX hydrogen. A lot of folks have pointed out liquid hydrogen is cold and it is. It's a mechanical engineering problem and we actually have some ideas and that we're going to be sharing very soon on, on just how to keep that cold. It needs to be zero boil off. Use active, active cooling. The gear ratio, the efficiency 
you know, we measure it in pounds of force per pound of, of, uh, of fuel consumed. It's, it's like 33% higher for hydrogen than it is for methane. And that is fundamental in allowing us to do some things. We're going to talk a little bit more about those this morning. But it also means we can create that fuel. We can, we can power this entire spacecraft system just with water. No carbon feedstock, no other complex chemical equations. It's electrolysis. That is a water-based economy. And when you talk about the water-based economy, the commercial value of starting to do resources at the moon, we talk a lot about everything from helium-3 to, to raw minerals. You need to find something that earthlings will buy. And, and it seems crazy, but earthlings will buy water from the moon. Not to bring down to here and to drink. We, we have that water. To bring it to low Earth orbit and use it to sort of spacecraft and move things up to higher orbit. And that allows the commercial entities to tie into the LEO market, right? So that's, that's the value creation. It's just one of many examples, but that's, that's the water-based economy of the future. And that's what we've harnessed here with uh, LOX Hydrogen. And we think that's very much key for exploration. Um, we, we've, some of the new concepts this year is this uh, water delivery vehicle. Um, and the idea is to um, have that vehicle bring water um, to your orbiting base camp um, and use the large solar rays uh, to generate the hydrogen and oxygen propellant. Um, and we see this as a, as a, a great place um, for commercial entities to participate in deep space exploration. Um, and we don't really care where the water comes from. Uh, come from Earth. We know there's water on Earth, um, but it could come from asteroids. It could come from shadowed lunar polar craters. Um, if we're really lucky, there's water on the Mars moons. Um, but it doesn't matter where, where that, that feedstock is. And um, we also uh, know that there's a, a number of companies out there, entrepreneurial companies like Planetary Resources, who are working on this today. And we're really excited about that vision of uh, water enabling deep space exploration. So, telerobotics and solar electric propulsion, deep space restartable cryo, LOX hydrogen, these are all enablers for Mars Base Camp that allow us to do Mars Base Camp in about a decade, but it doesn't end in Mars orbit. Base camps are not a, a destination unto themselves. They're the place from which you then set out, in this case, to descend to the surfaces of other worlds. That synergistic relationship between water-based economy and the highly efficient liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, propulsive system, allows us to take a new look and an approach at a lander. One that's refuelable, restartable, single stage. It's capable of landing on the Martian surface, supporting four astronauts for two weeks, while they achieve unprecedented science objectives, and then returning back to Mars base camp without being dependent on any surface propellant generation. So I'll go through a couple of facts and figures. Um, the lander has uh, 80 metric tons of uh, propellants, um, about 30 metric tons dry mass. Uh, and it's uh, the propulsion section very much based upon the Mars Base Camp uh, cryo propulsion stage. Um, it has about um, 132,000 pounds of thrust. The crew cabin um, is based on Orion. Orion is a great deep space sortie vehicle. So all of those systems, um, life support, cruise, uh, crew displays, avionics, um, those are all uh, the systems that are in this, this lander. Um, and the, from a Delta V capability point of view, uh, we've got about six kilometers per second um, uh, of Delta V capability. When we're re-entering, about 80% of that Delta V uh, for re-entry is, uh, is done by aerodynamic drag. And then that six kilometers per second is used for um, the supersonic retropropulsion and then for ascent back up to the surface. So you're thinking, 
Lockheed Martin, this just looks like Jules Verne. And where are the, where are the big heat shields? And, and the answer is you're starting from a base camp. You're starting from orbit. So when you look at the rovers and the landers that we've been working with NASA on for, for decades, right? We've been on, on Mars since 1976 with Viking. Those were direct entry systems. So they come straight from Earth to Mars and, and they enter at a very high velocity, very large energy that you have to get out. So we use a combination of heat shields and parachutes and went from airbags to the, uh, the sky crane that you saw with Curiosity. When you start from orbit, around Mars, you're starting with like five kilometers per second. And for those that were scribbling really quickly, so five kilometers per second, you subtract off 80% or four kilometers per second. For aerodynamic, use one kilometer per second of your delta V. And if you remember, we've got six kilometers per second of delta V with this vehicle, enabled by liquid hydrogen. It design doesn't close with methane, but it closes with liquid hydrogen. So it leaves you five meters, uh, five kilometers per second for, for getting back out and getting to Mars Space Camp and then going to where those water tenders are bringing you in. Five kilometers per second sounds like a lot, but the atmosphere of Mars is thin. The, uh, the entry, descent, and landing guys at JPL and at Denver say that the, um, the Mars atmosphere is enough to be annoying, but not enough to be really useful. And that's why we, uh, when we're coming down after the parachutes, we have to do something else. Airbags, sky crane, and what have you. But this is to our advantage here. It's thin. So even coming in at five kilometers per second, the dynamic pressure, the, the forces on the airframe are, are on the order of what we saw with the SR-71 that Lockheed built and started flying 50 years ago. The heat, the integrated or the, the, the instantaneous heat, obviously very hot, right, at the, on, the, on the nose cones and on the fins. So they have to be carbon reinforced, but it didn't have to be ablative. The heating isn't that high, so they're totally reusable. And then the titanium sides, titanium alloy, completely reusable. The integrated heat load for this thing is really less than what you would get from a, a supersonic aircraft that has to fly for hours on end, because we're coming in and taking it quickly. So the integrated heat load really isn't as, as hard as the problems that we've had to solve uh, even decades ago. Upon returning to Mars Base Camp, the lander refuels from cracked water and then is ready for another Martian sortie. Imagine in the early days of Martian exploration, you can go anywhere on the Martian surface. This is a huge enabler from cost, complexity, and safety, which is extremely important. And also, it reminds me of something we forgot to add, which is any time abort capability. So, one of the advantages of, of the lander is as you're coming in, if you see something you don't like, you just pull out, right? Because you were going to do that two weeks later anyway and lift off directly from the surface. So that gives you the ability to then refuel in orbit and then give it another shot when you like what you see. Mission success and safety with an in-time abort with a single stage vehicle like this. And with that access to the Mars surface, um, from a science perspective, being able to go to multiple locations with crew um, and then confirm your, your final landing location, that, that's great too. Um, and so, you know, extensibility and always knowing what's the next step, how does this fit in, um, that, that's a theme here as we go from Orion all the way forward. Um, and so when we get to um, longer term um, operations on the surface of the moon, um, the idea here is that this is the crew transportation vehicle um, and then for the larger pieces of cargo, um, there would be a, a, a one-way uh, cargo lander. And also from a um, ISRU perspective, of course, there's lots of water on, the, on Mars. What about the moon? Um, the moon has got about half the gravity of Mars. It doesn't have an atmosphere. Um, and when we've looked at the delta V that's required to um, go back and forth from the deep space gateway or the lunar base camp, that's about five kilometers per second. So that's within uh, the capability of this vehicle. With the zero boil off powered fuel system, the lander is extremely happy in the darkest craters on the lunar surface, exploring and getting valuable science from the South Pole Aiken Basin. The key to the lander into Mars Base Camp is really that thought of extensibility. We're using the technologies we have today, and with the lander as an example, using the technologies like Orion that we're building today for tomorrow. 
Remember, the path to Mars is through cislunar space. So I want to leave you with, with an image. Um, and I'd ask you to, to just close your eyes just for a second. Since I totally can't see you anyway, I don't know if you do or not, but I've got my eyes closed. Imagine yourself in the Mars Base Camp, deep transport, deep space transport, in between Earth and Mars, so maybe three or four months out. Earth has, has shrunk to just a, a pale blue dot, and Mars is still just a, a red pinprick in the sky, and, and the sun has gotten steadily smaller and dimmer as you've moved out. It's a colorless uh, uh, world out there, the, the magnificent desolation, uh, to quote a famous, a famous person. But inside, inside, you are surrounded with five people that look, they look like none of us because they look like all of us, right? These are going to be the six people that the most brave, adaptable, probably humble, able to work with others, finest folks that, that have ever walked this planet or any world in our solar system. And they're going to be, of all nationalities, they're going to be a swath of, of genders and backgrounds, experience bases. We're going to have engineers and technicians and doctors and psychiatrists and plumbers, and electricians, 3D printer people. Those those are the people that you're going to be sharing this experience with. And so for nine months, there's magnificent desolation on the outside and your crew on the inside. And at that point, about nine months in, everyone's going to flock to the windows. Because even the sun has gone away because you swung around the backside of Mars and you're doing your orbit insertion burn. And that's... That's when the transformational event is going to occur. Sunrise. Sunrise over another planet. Streaming in through the windows of, of Orion that the Americans contribute. And lighting up the interior of, of nodes and airlocks that perhaps the Russians contribute. And, and streaming in through lab windows. Chinese and Japanese perhaps. Cupolas from ESA. Lighting up the inside of a a living area contributed by the Australian Space Agency. <laughs> that is a transformational event for our generation. It, it's literally dawn of a new age of discovery about ourselves and about our solar system and our place in it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all explorers and the time is now. to the stage, Danielle, Tim, and Rob, please. Thank you very much. Um, I got a few questions uh, submitted from the audience, but not very many, and, and we might have time for more. Uh, and they're coming up right now. So raise your hand up high if, uh, if you need a piece of paper. 
to submit a question. I got a couple for the audience real quick. Uh, who wants to be, uh, who wants to fly on Orion? No, audience, sorry. Uh, who wants to uh, live, fly on Orion to cislunar space, live and work on the Deep Space Gateway? Pretty good, everybody's up for these questions. There's harder ones coming. Who wants to uh, leave Earth on Orion, spend some time getting ready in the Deep Space Gateway, and then climb aboard Mars Base Camp, take the round trip, long voyage to Mars and back to Earth? All right, that's the end of the easy ones. Guess what, there's only four folks that get to fly and work on the Deep Space Gateway initially. And then as Rob said, only about six on the first trip of Mars Base Camp till we get this up and going and establish a regular cadence. Who's willing to stay on Earth and dedicate their energy and their efforts and their treasure to make this a reality for, uh, for all of humankind? All right, I picked, the, I picked the right audience. Okay, now for the three of you, some of these questions are, uh, are pretty hard. Rob, I think you covered this right at the end. Is there a role for the Australian Space Agency to play? <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, first role um, is Canberra, right? So Deep Space Network, there are three sites uh, across the world. Uh, Australia is one. For any of you, who has seen the movie The Dish? I think, but who has seen E.T., by the way? <laughs> Thank God. Uh, so The Dish, fantastic movie, and uh, actually very, very cool. And it's about Australia's role when we landed on the moon. Canberra is an important part. It covers like 120 degrees of, you can calculate the stir radians from that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chihan. It's critical for deep space communications, which will include Orion, as we start to, to go out both to the moon and then on to Mars. But that's just the, that's the easy part, because that exists today. Every one of our systems has components that will be coming from across the world. So pick your favorite thing, pick what you're good at, like Grandma used to say, and go after that. Excellent, thank you. All right, these next ones, oh, I'm gonna combine a couple, and it basically comes down uh, to LOX, so we're gonna talk uh, rocket liquid engine propulsion. LOX hydrogen uh, versus methane. Tim, this is probably yours, and it comes in a couple of flavors. It's uh, uh, essentially, uh, why LOX hydrogen and not methane? It is, is there a benefit to having both? And it, it's also a separate question about uh, transfer of liquid hydrogen and microgravity. Okay. So why LOX hydrogen? So uh, a couple different reasons for the LOX hydrogen. Of course, the, the high efficiency um, is really important and enables things like the lander. Um, we've also been working with um, hydrogen upper stages for a long time, including the Atlas Centaur all the way back to the, to the 60s. Um, so we've, we, we know how to do those uh, types of systems. Um, to, the, to the question of should, should we have both hydrogen and methane? I, I think yes, that diversity of supply um, is important. Um, but what we see is that you know, you know, making methane on the surface of Mars, that's definitely a, an application. Um, but the water is in so many places in the solar system, um, so we want to have that diversity of supply chain of where your propellant feedstock is, is, uh, is, is coming from. And then the last one was, um, you know, transfer of cryogenic fluids and I assume, you know, storage of cryogenic fluids. Um, there's nothing magical in the physics there. We've got some engineering to do, um, but even more than the engineering, we've got lots of ground tests that are working on that right now, today, um, at places like NASA and Marshall. Um, and, and, but it's time to start uh, flying those uh, cryogenic storage and transfer systems, demo, demo, demonstrating that technology. Maybe the Deep Space Gateway is a good place to do that or do it um, in low Earth orbit. Okay, one more propulsion question, uh, Tim. What's the propellant for the solar electric propulsion? Xenon. Okay, there's a series of uh, essentially what I'll refer to as crew health questions. Uh, so we'll split these up. There's a question about uh, crew physical fitness, physical health, uh, mental health, and then a, a radiation protection uh, question. So uh, yeah. dibs, dibs on radiation. Oh. And then anti-dibs on the other ones. 
that was the one I wanted because we've done so much work in that area. But okay, let's start with the radiation protection. So, so there's two kinds of radiation you have to worry about, and, and a lot of you probably already know this. Galactic cosmic rays, hard to shield. We actually get a, a fair amount of benefit from hydrogen in those tanks. We, we tuck in the, the next step habitats that we've been talking about, the deep space gateway. Those are the, the tanks within the tanks. Um, those are hidden there. So that gives us some benefit. But NASA and the medical offices have been looking and evaluating the galactic cosmic ray radiation impact you know, relative to radiation workers here on Earth. And it looks like we're going to be okay there with some, um, some prudent type of shielding like we just talked about. What you have to worry about though is solar, uh, solar uh, events and, and solar uh, particles. The, uh, the issue there is that the background is okay, but then we have these solar particle events. And so on Orion, we actually have a couple of different things we're doing. One is a, what's called a, almost a safe box. Um, it's made out of kind of a polyethylene type box you put together. We call it a storm shelter in case there's a solar storm. And um, I'm not sure about you guys, but if I had to like go into a cozy, small, one meter cube box with Antonelli for two weeks straight, um, there might be a, a better solution out there. And there is, fortunate, no offense, but there is fortunately um, in the form of the, the next uh, um, kind of step in that is the the uh, stem rad vest. And so if you get a chance, come over to the, the Lockheed booth and check that out. These are a joint activity with Israel and DLR for a personal protection device for those solar electric. Uh, solar. See, you got me thinking solar electric. <laughs> solar. Storms. Thank you. So I don't really want to talk about the crew health of Rob and Tony being in a box for nine months, <laughs> but I will start talking about crew health is one of the most important things when you talk about human exploration, especially on like a thousand day mission. So a couple parts, there's the physical and then there's the mental part. Physical, we seem to have a better understanding of that, though we're still working on it. That's one of the things that we're doing with the Deep Space Gateway and NASA is really looking at is what equipment do we need and then how do we make that equipment more compact? I don't know, anybody heard of the Martian? It seems to be a pretty amazing expansive space. Um, the crew's not going to have that much room and so we're really looking at with using the Deep Space Gateway, how do we take that, the critical equipment in order to keep their bone density up, keep the muscle, muscle atrophy down, and really make sure that, that they're physically fit once they reach the Martian orbit and especially Martian surface to handle the loads of uh, working and exploring there. As far as crew mental health, aside from these two, um, you know, we do a lot of experiments here on Earth. Um, I'd like to give a shout out. Josh Ehrlich just came out of eight months in high seas. And so these analog research stations do a really good job of looking at crew interaction, making sure we don't have, you know, an angry crew by the time they need to actually perform their work and their duties at Mars, and then how we're going to get them home. So I think those analogs are really critical to evaluating crew psychology, and then also the support here on Earth. It's, you know, how do we make sure that the crew has time to themselves, has communication from their loved ones, as well as, you know, has the stamina to make it through that thousand day mission and still be really upbeat and excited about what they do every day. And everything's tied together, so as we design our vehicles, we need to take that all into account. You know, and as an example, the, the crew exercise periods at the Deep Space Gateway are, are driving our systems. The, the heat and humidity generated by that, we've got to take it into account. Excellent. And then I'm not sure if uh, you heard uh, Misha Kornienko at last year's IAC right after his one-year mission. He talked about the day after uh, his land and being in the gym. And then the one piece that I remember was swimming a kilometer um, right after his one-year mission. So uh, we're making great strides. We need to continue to study it and work it. Um, I'm getting the hook. I got time for one more question. Um, and it, uh, I guess uh, maybe all three of you can take a shot at it. Uh, I want to remind the media right after this event, uh, Danielle, Tim, and Rob will be available in the panorama room to answer more questions and conduct a press conference. And I didn't get through everybody's questions, but I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, we'll be uh, in and around to the Lockheed Martin booth if, uh, if you want your, uh, your question answered. Uh, so our final question, uh, given the available time, uh, can, uh, if you're not in a national space agency, is there a role to play? Uh, can, can you participate in the plan if you're not part of a national space agency? I'll, I guess Absolutely. I should remind you the four of us aren't in a Absolutely. national space agency. 
I was just at Space Generation Conference last week at Congress, so call out to them. And every single person in that room can participate in space exploration. It's not only the people that are wearing the suits with the flags on their shoulders as astronauts, it's the people that are actually contributing the ideas, those brilliant revolutionary technologies that we need, as well as actually building the spacecrafts. They're gonna take astronauts from today, like this image, to the Martian surface in the Orion, as well as those that are going to help us revolutionize the power production plants and the commercial services to really going and taking our humanity into deep space. Excellent, okay, uh, uh, time is short. Please, uh, one more round of applause for Danielle, Tim, and Rob. Thank you.